For Kramamedia's policy, I'm Sane Zamini, author and golf historian Barry Cohen is in conversation with policy about his book titled Let Me Play. So Barry, this book is about the first golfer of color to win a provincial open in our country, Papua Sukolam. For those who might not know him, can you briefly give us some insights into his life growing up in KZN? He was born in December of 1928. He was born in a, a shack to a blind mother and uh, he never went to school. So he was illiterate, didn't read or write. And his father died when he was 11. So he had to go out and work. At 13, he became a caddy and was finally discovered at the age of 27 while caddying for four gentlemen. And can you, can you just take us where he was introduced to the game of golf while he was fishing with his dad in Riverside near the Beachwood Golf Club? He lived near the golf club and his father, who, who was a, a fruit salesman at that time, used to like fishing and would take Papua with him to go fishing. So Papua was a little boy like a lot of us. We'd go we'd eight years old or nine years old. We'd go, we'd go fishing. And uh, he would see these golfers playing golf. And it, it intrigued him. So uh, his father, while, he, while he was, his father was fishing, Papua had to amuse himself. So his father uh, made a golf club for him by cutting off uh, some bark and made a kind of golf stick for him and uh, and then uh, he used he used whatever he could to to hit the ball as if it was a, a golf ball uh, we don't know if he actually had found a golf ball or, or he was just hitting pebbles and pods um, but where that developed further along the line is that once he became a caddy, uh, the, the people who, where they used to, to wait to get a bag, to caddy a bag, they, they used to be given, uh, there was a, a space there, and they used to, the caddies used to like to compete amongst themselves. So because they didn't have golf clubs, they would get a, a piece of wire and twirl it around so that uh, at the bottom it was like a club face and they would they would then challenge each other to hit the ball into the hole or get closest to the hole and play for a penny here a penny there but because the club head was so light at the bottom of the club they most of them started playing with a reverse grip which became known as the caddy grip and subsequently as the Papua group. It broke my heart when I read that his father died. So he had to, in a way, take over and help his mom and sister. There was a part in the book where he said he had no love for the game of golf when he started, but his stomach was the thing that introduced him to the game of golf. Can you tell us about that difficult period in his life? Well, in the Indian culture, the woman didn't go out and work. So he and his brother had to go out to work because he had other siblings and they had to support mm -hmm. the family. Mm -hmm. When he became a caddy, uh, you know, it's uh, carrying a bag at 13 for people. Uh, I did it um, for pocket money. But, but if you get a heavy bag, you get somebody who, who uh, flukes you, swears at you, uh, you know, it's not that pleasant uh, a thing to do. And sometimes you go along, especially when you're young, you, you go along, he would have gone along, and he would have spent the whole day there hoping to get a bag. Now, the, the sort of money they earned for, for caddying was very, very little. So when he says he did it for his stomach, was merely to try and earn enough money to get food in their, in their stomach, but it wasn't even enough. He sometimes had to go without food. So, so that's how, 
how poor he was um, and the family were, uh, it, uh, there, there are quite a few people even today who, who struggle just as, as hard. Yeah, and I've heard about stories of, of caddies because my husband was, was also a caddy at some time. <laughs> so allowing the caddies to play on Mondays also helped him to sharpen his skills. He even won that tournament that, that was at the Caris Fountain course. That must have been a huge milestone in his career given the restrictions they faced due to the apartheid at the time. I know he was not even allowed to play in the white tournament. Can you tell us about that? Yes, um, most clubs did not allow caddies to play. And if, if caddies or if people of color wished to play, they had to go and play in the bush. There were golf clubs that they organized in the bush. The only one that was an official golf club was the uh, Durban Indian Golf Club, which was a nine hole golf club. And that meant that certain clubs did allow caddies to, to play, but in Papua's case, they were only allowed to play before nine o'clock in the morning on a Monday, which meant they had to uh, leave home at five o'clock, get to the course and, and play their golf. Of course, it was a lot of competition amongst the caddies and a lot of excitement, but if they missed that, that slot, from around about six to nine o'clock in the morning on a Monday, that was it, no more golf that week. So when he was 16, he, he was persuaded by the, by the other caddies and the caddy master to go and play in the Natal Indian Amateur Open, which was actually open to all, all, all players of color. And he won it. They did not want to give him the trophy because they said he was too young. But the where he, where he caddied at the club, the club captain, Martindale, uh, insisted, phoned, phoned the authorities and insisted that he be given the trophy. So he won his first tournament at 16, uh, first provincial tournament of color. And then from 1955, when he was already 20, around about 23, uh, he won his first Natal non-European Open. And from then onwards, he simply dominated. And yeah, I remember he also went uh, to play in East London in 1961, where the doors actually opened for him in this kind of career. But he faced a lot of issues uh, that were apartheid related even at the time. Can you also tell us about the restrictions that he faced while playing that tournament? Well, you're right. In 1961, he was given permission to go and play in the South African Open, where he injured his hand just beforehand and, uh, and only came 16. Uh, and thereafter, he wasn't allowed to play again until he was allowed to play in 1963 in the Natal Open. However, what they'd discovered, there was a loophole in the law. A golfer of color was allowed to be on the golf course, but not in the clubhouse, which meant he, he wasn't allowed to get any food or go to a pollution block or, or uh, go to have a shower, nothing. But furthermore, in most of the instances, he was simply told the day before that he could play in these tournaments when he was allowed to play. Uh, and then finally, he wasn't allowed to practice. Now, before a tournament, a few days before a tournament, most of the golfers will go and have a few practice rounds, work out their strategy. But in Papua's case, he wasn't allowed to do that. In that game where he eventually won uh, 800 in the, at the Natal Open now in 1963, there is something that happened that uh, took me by surprise. Many countries after that game uh, restricted our country in terms of sports. Can you tell us why was that done? In 1959, Papua, in his second tournament, uh, won the Dutch Open. Now you must understand, this was the the second white tournament he had ever played in. 
Uh, he had qualified for the Open in 59, di didn't do too well, and he he won the Dutch Open against the top field. He then won the Dutch Open three times in four years. N nobody's ever done that before, and the only other three players who've ever won it three times were Sevi Ballesteros, Simon Dyson, and Bernard Langer. So they're all famous golfers. So by that stage, he was on the world stage. He, he possibly was the first player of color to win a national open. Uh, certainly, he was the first player to ever win a national open and the only player using a reverse grip that is holding the club back to front. So by 1963, when he was finally, after winning the Dutch Opens, the, there was a lot of pressure on the government to allow him to play in the Natal Open. And they have their champion, Harold Henning, as well as other champions like Bobby Favey and Dennis Hutchinson and so on, who they thought would beat him. Papua won, and then he was given the trophy in the rain. He wasn't allowed into the clubhouse, and the white golfers went into the clubhouse and got their prizes. The photo of him getting it in the rain shamed especially India. It went around the world. The world was outraged, but India was even more outraged, which led to India having South Africa banned from the 1964 Olympics. What was also interesting is now Papua, who wasn't political, became the figurehead of the anti-apartheid sport movement. He was the first international sportsman of color who had broken through. Uh, and uh, it was ahead of rugby and cricket. And it, it was heartwarming, Barry, to read that he became an international sports celebrity, receiving invitations to play even in India, where he was popular and treated well, if you compare it to the treatment that he received in, in South Africa. Can you tell us how he was treated in India? He was invited in 1967 to mm -hmm. go and play in India and play in the Indian Open. At that stage, he was again living in a shack. He had uh, the Group Areas Act had moved him uh, and uh, he arrived in India and suddenly he was an icon, like a Bollywood film star. Wherever he went, he was fated. The woman swooned over him. He was a total celebrity in India because he was the first international Indian sportsman of Indian extraction to succeed on the world stage. So he couldn't even if he went to buy some toothpaste. He was mobbed by crowds. He came sixth in the Indian Open, which wasn't a bad result. It was very, very hot. But then he was offered the position of club, club uh, professional at the Royal Calcutta Golf Club, which is the, the second oldest golf club in the world, and which had have a few thousand members. Up to that stage, it was always a white golf professional, and only three years prior to that, that did they have their first Indian club captain. So this was a very prestige position that was offered to him with a home, a good salary, and the ability to still play in some uh, major international tournaments. Before just going back a step, when he was playing in the Indian Open, when he got there, he discovered that the South African flag was not being flown. That was because India had broken off relationships with South Africa and had South Africa banned from the Olympics. Well, Papua said, no, I'm not going to play unless the South African flag is flown. So after he got this position, offered this position at the Royal Calcutta Golf Club, he turned it down. He turned it down. Some say, well, why did he turn it down? His, his wife, 
Sumintra did not want to leave Durban. He had his friends in Durban. And he thought because he had in 1965, and maybe you'll ask me about it, he had beaten Gary Player in the Natal Open. He thought he, the government would change its views towards him. But he was mistaken. And the man rose from humble beginnings against all odds. What life lessons do you think this book is trying to get uh, across to the readers, especially those who understand the, the game of golf? There are a few lessons. The one obvious which we've seen today in golf is that there's no particular style of how to play golf. It's simply how many shots you get into the, the hole. Uh, so Papa played with a reverse grip. The others today play with all kinds of swings. It was um, that side of golf has changed. And however you play, that as long as you can hit the ball. But the life lesson is simply how a, a man against all odds followed his passion, followed his, his ability and uh, believed in himself. I mean, when he played in these tournaments uh, in South Africa, he was the only person of color, whereas the rest of the field were all white people. And um, it just showed that he, he had the ability and he believed in himself. Sadly, uh, the government decided his, a different fate for him in South Africa because they banned him from playing in South Africa and they took away his passport because he was too good. It was as simple as that. But it showed how one should be inspired by how somebody from such a humble beginning can believe in himself and can rise right to the very top when he beat Gary Player at the time, the world number one. And Perry, when I, when I read his story, I know now we do have the Gary Player tournament. Aren't you asking yourself, why don't we have um, the Papua Sukalam tournament? Because he deserves that. He certainly deserves it. And they mm -hmm. probably have a, the, I'm sure there is a Papua Sukalam golf day, a one-off day, but you're quite right. The authorities, uh, until I wrote my first book, they'd never ranked in the rankings of Southern African golfers. Papua never featured. Never. His name was never mentioned, as was, uh, as was none of the other players. And, that, and hopefully I changed that because I have him ranked as number seven in, in Southern Africa, uh, which is basically where Gary Player also, also said he, he should be ranked. Um, so you, one would have to ask the, uh, the Sunshine Tour why they, they have never named one of their tournaments after Papua Subalum. Very good question. Uh, and that's, that's my only answer. <laughs> And lastly, Perry, for those who would want to read this book, where can they get this copy? Uh, the, the copy, and, and this is the actual book, the, the copy is available at all the bookstores. Uh, it's on Amazon. And, of course, if they want to get it from me, it's bjcohen at mweb.co.za.